When do you actually plan? It says, do you see it says live on YouTube? Is it supposed to say that? Supposed to be streaming it on YouTube? I, I think so. Yeah, because she wants it on YouTube. <laughs> I hope it, it's going to be hard to hear, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 there's two video screens. There's this one here right now. Extremely. Yeah. Got to just mute either Katie or Angie. Well, let's get started. It's great to see everybody's smiling face. Oh, my gosh. I think it'll be easier to follow when you sit there. So if you can hear me, just raise your hand and I'll talk louder. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, Fire Department, Fort Lane Fire Department, Village, and the town for offering us such a very large room for the meeting. Thanks, uh, thanks for uh, for hosting the uh, our uh, our board meeting. <clears throat> In your emails, uh, you you received a, uh, a a proposed agenda for today's meeting. I hope everyone had an opportunity to look at it. If there's no questions about it, do I have a, a motion to accept the uh, the uh, agenda as proposed? Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Who was the first? Also, in your uh, in your uh, emails, Tom and Mike. Also in your packets, your emails, you received a uh, minutes from our April 19th uh, combination Zoom uh, in-person uh, commission meeting. Um, I hope everyone had an opportunity to review those minutes. If I uh, no questions, please, I have a motion to accept those minutes. I move. Leona. Second. Who's? I second. Mike. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Again, thanks to uh, Fort Leiden, uh, Fire Department, the Village, and the Town for, for hosting our, uh, our commission meeting today. Just a couple of uh, points I want to kind of bring up here is that uh, as we've uh, been discussing over the last uh, several months that we have a community recognition award nomination that's due here in just a couple of weeks on June 1st. Uh, our intentions, our hopes are that on October 14th, we will uh, present a couple of awards at our annual meeting at Tailwater. And of course, uh, the awards are gonna be for local government and then also for uh, community groups. And community groups is uh, anybody that is not local government okay <clears throat> and really i think that the focus that we've kind of tailored this uh recognition award is that we're really looking for those organizations that uh have gone above and beyond to implement a project that made a real impact in their area or in their community and that's a uh, a project or that's a uh, some type of an implementation plan that they've done in the last five years you know, the criteria, we have kind of rolled it out as four holds. Number one, we're looking for uh, to build local capacity. So any program that is uh, kind of uh, satisfied building local capacity, you know, we want to promote number two uh, actions or projects uh, in partnership that, with others. Number three, uh, we're well supported by the community. And number four, can serve as a model to be replicated in other areas. So really what we would like to do is get the word out because I think we only have one so far. Uh, yep. And June 1st will be here in a couple of weeks. So anything you can do to talk to your communities, any ideas, we can, I'm sure we can help you along with that, but it would be nice to have several alternatives to choose for these two, uh, uh, these two new uh, recognition awards. If you can help, I would appreciate it. You know, over the last 14 months, we've really kind of stepped up as a uh, the staff has stepped up. The commission has really stepped up to get our message out. You know, and that message is the new world of Zoom. And we've had a uh, quite a few 
uh, historical perspective webinars as well as training webinars. And I really, you know, it's an inexpensive way to get a message out. We really did a really good job with that. Um, Leona, I, I really love what you and your son did. That was that was that was wonderful. The, the, uh, um, Constable Chronicles, that was really nice. But we, we got a list of, of webinars that we're doing. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of a couple of things that we're doing here. We've got, um, and I believe we've got the first of three series coming up here on the 10th. 20th. On the 20th, May 20th. Yeah. And then we got uh, June 10th and then June 24th, which is the Underground Railroad. And uh, I'll tell you participated in that. That should be a really good one. On May 19th, um, how can uh, uh, broadband be delivered at 1 p.m.? And that's really a Southern Tier Network, how they did it. On May 20th, we have the rise and fall of the Florence Settlement at 7 p.m. That should be a really good one. Um, just a couple of webinars at the Black River, uh, Black River Watershed uh, is putting together with help with the Tug Hill Commission. On 519, we, we have, and you're going to have to help me with this, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Adelgid? Adelgid. Okay. Is that the Yeah. And how that's really impacting the changing climate here in the, in the area. Uh, on 526, for somebody, for, for those of us who live on Tug Hill, we have ice and snow best practices. <laughs> that should be a good one. <laughs> I think Will Banks has a great idea for practicing that stuff. Sarasota. <laughs> well, I'm just going to tune in to see if I've been doing it wrong all these years. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and then, of course, we've got a couple others. Uh, New York State Conference of Mayors and the Association of Towns uh, on June 1st is, uh, is putting together a webinar for the new cannabis laws, which everyone should kind of tune into. That should be interesting. From a community in a uh, village town. Or two now. What's that? Two now. Uh, I think you should tune in. It should be good. <laughs> yeah. And then on uh, May 19th, we have uh, a DC webinar, wetland regulatory status. And so there you can see there's a lot of, you know, we've kind of stepped up in how we've, uh, you know, pick a table, and any table. <laughs> And how we really stepped up. And thanks to the, uh, the staff for really working through these. These have been great, great messaging systems. And the advent of, uh, of uh, Zoom. You know, I've learned my, my days over the last several, several months have been filled with Zoom and Outlook uh, conference calls. And uh, I really learned how not to tell a joke on a Zoom call. Because nobody seems to get it virtually. No, no, no. It's a joke. <laughs> so, nobody seems to get it virtually. <laughs> I give up on the jokes. Now you see why And with that, that's all I have. You. Uh, we'll turn right up to the executive director report. Uh, welcome everybody to our bigger, biggest commission meeting we've had back in person since. So it's really amazing to see everybody here and uh, uh, just thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. It's amazing we all recognize each other. I know. Well, you know, the Zoom, it helps. At least you remember what faces look like. I see Joe Rollins is heading in too, so uh, he'll be in. I now we're in for jokes. Oh yeah. Joe, Joe's a good jokester, so... Um, administrative wise, uh, so the, as you all know, the COVID guidance changes on a daily basis and it's hard to kind of keep track of it. Um, but starting uh, May 16th, May 17th, offices statewide are open 75% capacity. Um, I have not been able to get a response from the second floor about our return to work plan and if I'm, I can modify that or not, but I am going to move forward with assuming we are in an office so we can open up at a 75% capacity, um, which would mean eight people allowed in the office at a time. So I'm gonna to try to bring people back even more starting June 1st. Um, we've been back at 50%, we haven't had any problems. Um, 
it's, it's working out fine. And we have a lot of space in the office. As you know, we all have individual offices. It's not as though we're in cubicles on top of each other. How's your staff doing on uh, vaccinations? Yeah, um, I know most of them are, are vaccinated. There's a few I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm not asking the you question. Really it's a, yeah, I'm not asking the question, but many have volunteered that they are vaccinated. So the more the better, you know, as far as bringing people back into the office and bringing them back in cars. You know, the people, some of us that are all vaccinated, we have ridden together now in cars because that's pretty much okay. Um, Gives you such a peace in mind, doesn't it? It does. It's, it's nice to walk in and not have to worry about that. Um, staffing. So Jean's last day in the office is June 22nd. So that's really coming up super fast. Um, she will be at the next commission meeting in Forest Court to see everyone in person. And she is on Zoom, but um, she'll be in person in Forest Court as kind of her swan song. Her actual retirement date isn't until towards the end of July, but she's taking a bunch of vacation time. Um, I have everything but one piece of the puzzle to bring John Helt, the no cog circuit rider on board. I have the second floor signature. I have governor's office of appointment signature. I do not have budget signature. It is sitting at DOB. I am calling and emailing on a, at least a weekly basis, if not more. I'm trying not to irritate anyone, but at the same time, they really need to realize this is a high priority. And I'm getting very anxious because if he's not on board um, when Jean is done on June 22nd, we're going to have to make some significant changes in the office. I mean, someone's got to take over coordinating that. I mean, Joe and Lisa and John are doing a great job at attending all the meetings, but there's a ton of coordination that goes on behind the scenes. There's putting announcements together. There's responding to requests. There's talking to the, the associate circuit writers every month. I mean, it's just a lot. So, um, I don't know what else to do. I, I, I don't have a, I don't think I can get into the Capitol to sit on anyone's desk. Um, it's not open yet, but that's where we're at. And Matt's, Matt's um, paperwork for his promotion is sitting in the same place. Uh, very frustrating because we certainly, um, certainly need those things done. But well, given how long it's taking to get all that done, I think we do need to move forward with starting the projects director, Phil. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's going to yeah, take I forever. The sooner we start, the better. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the second floor kind of for their blessing to move forward with that and, um, and keep my fingers crossed. But it's kind of a tough, tough position we're in right now, and I would welcome any advice, but I don't know what else I can do can't force someone to sign a piece of paper. Who are we talking about the budgets right now? Um, our budget officer, our budget. and then there's a labor relations unit within budget, and they're the ones that are holding it. And no reason. No, not, not that I have determined. He, I, as far as I know, passed all the background checks, you know, all that paperwork you have to do, the justification, it's all down there. No one's told me there's an issue. Perhaps we should make a phone call. Yeah, maybe you and I need to yeah. talk about that. Okay. Um, and then as, as um, Jan said, we do have just one submission so far to the community recognition program. So I'm really hoping we get some more in. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of times people wait till the last minute. So I expect I'll get, you know, a bunch right before the deadline. But when is the deadline? June 1st. Close. It's Two getting weeks. there. And you got Memorial Day weekend in there too. So really. You would think they would want to get it done before the holiday. Are you really looking for uh, this next week? This local governments to nominate themselves, or like a citizen to nominate a government, more or less. You know, it can be any way. I mean, if we have, I don't really, I don't have any kind of preconceived notion about that. So the one that we have um, is a is not a local government one; it's a community one, um, and it was proposed by. A person who works for this organization, but it was an, an example of a project that really brought in a lot of outside supporting mm -hmm. organizations to make something happen. Is the uh, circuit writers pretty much on um, Zoom calls or in person? Are they going to talk about? Oh it yeah, I think it's been Angie spending your monthly announcements for a couple months. Yeah. Any feedback at all or comments? I have heard from uh, one of my colleagues that they went 
was nominated for that. And it was, you just know, it was made in terms of community property. It was nominated for It's not the one I received. So. Does the project have to be done? Yes. And it can, it's, I think our look back time period is five years. So um, we'll keep hoping for more on that. Some regional projects, um, minimum maintenance roads. I did meet with the Assembly Transportation Committee uh, staff and, and council a couple of weeks ago on a phone call. Um, again, it was a good conversation, but there's still questions and there, you know, it's just not a priority bill for them. So they, you know, they would like to delve into it, but they just never quite get to delving into it. Um, so I, again, I, I feel a little stuck on that. Um, you know, these are some proposed bill edits that we were hoping to get in this year to address um, all the concerns that have come up with the appellate court decision um, and some other things. And we don't. <laughs> Roger, you're in demand. Somebody wants you. Uh, so, you know, I did have a conversation with uh, Senator Griffo's office, and they said, um, please let us know what we'll get through on the assembly side. And as long as it's reasonable, we will modify the bill to incorporate that because they realize that's the hold up. But until I have something from the assembly that says, this is good language, go for it. You know, what's the, what's the point? Um, Are we close to that? Or? Well, I think we have, I think we did a really good job. Angie, Matt, Jean, and I really delved into and, and, and rewrote the bill in a much more streamlined fashion. Um, it, it, addressed, it addressed things that needed to be addressed from the original bill language. I think it's pretty good. The couple of questions that are coming up, there's one sentence in there about, um, that's related to zoning. And there was a comment made that you're talking about highway law modifications, yet you've got something in zoning about zoning and highway law. So there was a concern about that. And she wanted to kind of do some research. What, what, was, what was it? I think it's because it's it's not in it's in highway law to be talking about zoning and highway law isn't like kosher, I guess. I don't really I don't really know. So I've asked Lori Miffin to I went to Association of Towns and asked Lori Miffin to take a look at that and see what she thinks if that's a conflict to have a, a, something that talks about zoning and highway law. Um, another one of the things that they wanted to research but haven't gotten to is um, apparently. Decades ago, um, according to them, there was some kind of DOT regulation that didn't just predicate the maintenance of these type of roads on the number of, of vehicles per day. There was some other element that they were using um, to predicate maintenance regimes. And she can't remember exactly what that regulation was, but she wanted to go back and find it um, to make sure what we're doing now kind of related to what was done then. And, and I don't have access to that. She's like, it's in a folder somewhere that she's got to dig in, and it's just, it's a time thing. Yeah. Because um, I know that all the many, many, many sideways we have in Tom Redford, for example, uh, those were constructed in the 1800s. Uh, they're not wide enough for uh, the legal road now. And the other problem we have, of course, is that we have a lot of state property on every yeah. one of them, and the state. No, they don't want you to cut the, the brush along the side of the road. So, you know, it cost a small portion at this point in time to, because uh, you gotta, you'd have to completely rebuild the whole road because there's no subways. Okay. So, that's why it's, it, we're pretty well, hands are tight, pretty well, what yeah. we can do with the road. And the, the third element that she wanted to, to look into more is we added, um, some language that talks about so if a landowner petitions the town board to have the, the, the designation change from minimum maintenance to something that's year-round maintenance and they get denied by the town board before there was no recourse that landowner was just done so now we've added at the criticism you know based on some criticism we got on that we've added okay so the landowner gets denied they could do a, a, a petition they could have get a petition get them both on it to force it for a referendum to give them a circuit breaker, if you will. Um, and she wanted to, and that needs to be discussed, I guess, too. But I, a lot, that's done in a lot of other situations, you know, so. Uh, that's the same, that's the different legislation that talks about permits of preference. But it kind of, yeah. Adding it in 
But is everything that's included in, in that language and person, is it, I don't, is it included in the language? Not specifically. Not specifically, yeah. So we'll see. I think that, I think the law that a lot of towns passed a number of years ago, they came out of Cornell University. Mm -hmm. I think it was a, there was language in that they could petition, but in reality, uh, <laughs> You were unlikely to get a petition signed by enough people. Yeah, I would think that. But the other thing, uh, it would take a long process. If you had to bring a road up, you had to get you had to get easements on every piece of property on the whole highway because when they built those roads in eighteen hundred, there's no easement whatsoever. Yeah. So just by uh, use, you would have to get an easement on every piece of property and everything like that. Uh, it would be almost impossible. Hopefully. So, I, um, so the COGS the COGS have agreed to do a sign-on letter um, of some sort. I'm not sure if we don't have the bill language, and I don't know who that gets addressed to. Um, you know, it's like we're caught in this like I don't know how to move this forward. Would you, honestly, like they want they want the towns to sign off. Is that the well, the, the towns could, but it's easier if you just say it's the five councils of government right, on behalf right. of all their towns right. and send it to someone <laughs> to try to push the issue, <clears throat> but. Yeah, exactly. So do you send it to the, all of the assembly transportation committee members? <laughs> I don't know if that's really useful. Just curious, how many towns you know, back in the in the nineties actually, especially in the corporate title council, <clears throat> how many towns were at, really put together uh, low volume road designations? I know that we did Montague, I'm just curious how many towns did. Did we have yeah. records of that? Uh, we did. We, did. we, we have, have to We have a couple towns that are doing it right now. It's been a steady progression uh, here for the years. And there's been several outside towns that Are there some towns that don't have it in the court? Yeah. Oh, still? Yeah. Yeah. Because that was really the, the plan even back in the 90s was it was to be a building, the building stuff we do. Yeah, recognize everybody. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got minimum yeah. low volume roads here, and then we'll worry about the legislation. And then we started kind of uh, dabbling into minimum maintenance roads, and boy, we ran into a lot of obstacles with that. <laughs> like nobody wanted to, you know, get never wanted to address it. But right. at least you know we created a, a step here. Yeah. Change it to minimum maintenance roads, which is a more accurate definition. Yeah. So. That continues. Um, you know, it's little bites. I look at it that way, but at least we've got at least an audience now that we can, we can address and, and, and the details are going to be. It's the details. It's the details. The devil's in the details. So, yeah. um, broadband, uh, we had a nice presentation last um, commission meeting by Elena and Carla. Uh, the surveys are now live in Oswego and Oneida counties. And if you live in one of those counties, you might have gotten an email from me last week with the link and really push it out to your networks, people you know, to get a lot of response to that because that'll improve the whole project. Um, we had a very good webinar last week with Scott Rasmussen, who's the head of the Broadband Program Office for Empire State Development, who works out of the city. Um, we were really lucky to get him and he talked about all the efforts the state is undertaking. And then he talked about all the money that's coming for broadband. And there's like a lot of money that's going to be available for broadband improvements. And the key is really being ready for it when it gets released, because you're going to have a, a two to three month turnaround for an application. And if you don't know what you need to do, you're never going to be prepared for it. Um, so Lewis County, I mean, their report's done. Um, and I actually read it over the weekend again. And there are some pockets that are identified in there as this is where you could spend money. So I I'm actually going to um, reach out to Lewis County. They have set up a subcommittee, right, um, Angie, I think, um, a legislative subcommittee to, to take on this broadband, and they've set aside a bunch of their um, Merrick, their ARPA money for this. So that's because they're farthest along. They're, they might be best positioned for grant applications. So, so that keeps plugging along, and it's, it's a good project for us. Uh, as Jim mentioned we're having our uh, marijuana webinar on June 1st with Association of Towns and ICOM. We get a lot of questions about how do villages or towns opt out? 
what's it going to mean for my employees as far as testing and all, all those kind of things. And so we're hoping that think, <laughs> uh, they have they, some of the answers. Employees. Because that's a federal law. It's federal, yeah. So, but we need that needs to be explained by an expert, you know. So we're we're, we're bringing them in to, to to talk about this and, and lay it out for people. And I I think we have quite a few communities considering opting out of hosting dispensaries in their in their jurisdictions. I think there was an article just over the weekend about Blaville. Um, so. But that's already got, I think, over 100 people signed up. Association of Towns and Nikon are, you know, advertising that beyond just the region because they're partnering with us. <clears throat> the American Recovery Plan, um, there's a lot, a lot coming out on that. The Treasury did release some interim guidance on May 10th. Um, it's still not super detailed. Um, and I don't think any of our towns and villages have gotten their money yet because their money is going to go through the state and then get distributed down to those non entitlement communities. Um, I, was fun, fun, fun. I was in a meeting last week, uh, and the uh, county minister was we know the dollars are going to have it's going to come, it's half of it this year, mm -hmm. next, but we just got a book, uh, it's 150 pages of. Uh, Rules. The, the rules so you just got that last week so. counties are lucky because you're getting your money direct counties are getting money directly from the federal yep. government but the the localities the towns and the villages and i'm not sure i think the cities might be getting it directly from the feds but definitely towns and villages is going from the state so and i think there's some language in there about it can't be scooped it can't be held it's got to go through so so uh, <laughs> within a certain amount of time yeah. well. yes so I know what the county we're planning on doing once we get that, once we get our administrators, those people up to speed of some of the regulations and we're gonna have a joint committee uh, meeting with all the towns and villages and cities and, and sit down and review the whole thing with them so everybody's on the same page. Okay. And see if there's any, any projects that we work together with to make the money more efficient for everybody. Um, CFAs are open the, after no round of CFAs last year, consolidated funding app, application through the Regional Economic Development Councils. There is one this year. It came out a little late, so it's a, a tad later due, deadline date, um, due July 30th. Right now, um, the only thing we have are requests to assist with snowmobile groomer grants. We've got five, um, possibly a sixth one right now, and some of the the snowmobile clubs have gotten a lot more capable of doing some of this on their own. At first, the whole online um, application portal was a hurdle for them, but they've gotten they've gotten a lot better on it. Um, so, I, but that's all we've got so far. I don't know if we have a lot of town and village type applications. I'm thinking, you know, if you go through a parks grant and all the headache you've got with that, rather than if you have a project you want to do, maybe they're just going to use their federal stimulus money. I mean, to me, it makes some sense just because grant money is not easy to get. Uh, and speaking of snowmobiles, uh, I have a, I got an email late Friday of an early draft of the snowmobile economic impact study that we are participating with uh, Lewis County and, and also the remainder of our counties. And I can't release it yet because there's some tweaks and then there's going to be a big press release. But it's looking, it's a really nice product, first of all, and the numbers are pretty big. I think uh, this is going to make some splash when, when it gets uh, released. Remember, this was the Center for Community Studies at JCC doing all the surveying and the snowmobilers. Um, you know, preliminarily, it looks like Oswego County actually has a bigger economic impact than Lewis County from snowmobiling, which surprised me. And in my mind, I think about Lewis County having a bigger impact. More but, people. But more people coming up through closer to maybe the Syracuse area. But we'll have that, I'm hoping, for our next commission meeting. And that's going to be really nice, I think, for these snowmobile clubs to be able to point to when they're asking for their groomer grant money. To say, look at this has got an economic impact, and those groomers are not cheap. Oh, no. They're and for a nonprofit zone club to come up with money is pretty difficult. So um, that's not good. 
Uh, the community cohesion survey we've been talking about should be open this coming week. Remember, we have that regional task force that's talking about ways to try to make our communities more welcoming and get more, um, more kind of volunteerism in communities for fire, you know, the fire departments or what have you. So that should be um, coming to you this week. It should be in Tugville Times. Since we're here in, in Port Leiden, I wanted to highlight a project we've been working on for a while, the South Lewis Schools Reuse Plan. Um, you probably know the two elementary schools in, in South Lewis are gonna be closing at the end of the school year. Glen, there's one in Glenfield and one here in Port Leiden. And we've been working for years with a group of people, including the school district and the county and some other players uh, to see what's gonna to happen to those schools when they close. Because as we know from past experience, they can go really, really good or go really, really bad. And everyone wants to avoid the bad um, outcomes. So they were put on the market uh, three or four months ago. And the school district actually find, uh, accepted two purchase offers last week at their board meeting. So Port Leiden, so here in the village was purchased by two local residents, Mark and Kim Lemieux, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they intend to convert the Lincoln Street side to senior housing and then intend to convert the other side of the building for multi-use purposes, like a restaurant, retail space, community, et cetera, et cetera. So local person bought it, some housing, and some mixed use is it's the plan. Assisted, assisted is that who that is? Yes, in Bruno. Oh, in, in an Ida County. No, in Lewis. Oh, in Lewis County. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Oh, okay. Well, that... Okay. Oh, I think sure. they have a pretty good record with the successor head of Super County, but the uh, parish elementary and not what jail water is. Uh, so yeah. They so close, I think we have a pretty good successor at the work with communities on that. So hopefully this, this will all work out good too, because <laughs> as part of that whole reuse plan process, there was a lot of community outreach. Like, what do you guys, what does the community want to see in these buildings? You know, what kind of yeah. uses would you like? What kind of uses would you not like? It was made very clear that they wanted to try to obviously put the buildings back on the tax roll, but also preserve some of the sewer and water units associated with the buildings, because if you lose all that, then your sewer and water rates for the remainder of the community will go sky high. Um, so that sounds positive. Now, the Glenfield um, School was purchased by a company called Comp Institute of IT. It's called LIT, L -I -T, L -I -I -T for short. Um, and they are an IT tech company planning to use the facility as a training center in addition to some multi-use options. So that might be, mean some jobs. Where are they? I, if it's the one I heard, they're out of Texas. Is that the, the school, the small school that's right in the center of town? In Glenfield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. It used to be a hub for a lot of uh, handicapped students. So a lot of the interior is much easier to get around than some of the other older schools. Yeah, I think it, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, it. Yeah. I think yeah. so. But I know that like on May for the, well, they used to accept students from a lot of other districts there for service. It's not so it's, very simple to upgrade, but that's the upgrade. The original is pretty small. <laughs> I think that the, if I remember correctly, the Glenfield building went, the, the purchase off, the, the, the sale price was $250,000 and the Port Leiden building, I wanna say was $150,000. So reasonably priced, I would oh, say, say, when, yeah, you, when you talk about the facilities and the land. Yeah, yeah. 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 Have you heard anything about any changes to that or that? I have not. Are they? Um, West Leiden has a Facebook page, and they're saying on there that they're going to board meetings because they're planning to close West Leiden Elementary. Okay. Hmm. The student population is really dry oh, in yes. the district. I remember my oldest kids graduated. There was about 120, 125 in the class, and I don't think that there's 80. Now, well, we'll have to keep our ears open, and if, if it does go that way, if they want, you know, they want to do something similar. I mean, not that the reuse study 
was totally completed for either of these two buildings in South Lewis. Um, but there was a lot of buzz around it. And there was stuff being talked about. It wasn't like the community was ignoring the situation. Um, so that's, the, that's just a, a local interesting project. And then I would, I just wanted to mention that planning, um, our planning work, like everything is starting to see an uptick. I think with people COVID kind of getting over and people feeling more comfortable and get back to meetings, we're getting a lot of requests for, for planning and not just solar. Before this had been more focused on solar, but now it's kind of everything under the sun. So Matt, are you on? Yes, yep, I'm on. Um, yeah, as, Kate, as Katie says, we're getting, we have a lot of kind of pent up demand for planning work. And uh, we, we started three pretty big new uh, projects, one in uh, Albion, one in Western and one in Worth, all with uh, zoning updates and or solar um, work. So that's, those are gonna keep us pretty busy. And we're, we're also seeing a big increase in uh, technical assistance requests from zoning officers and planning board chairs, um, which we really, we didn't see a lot of those during the, the COVID times. Um, so that it also, I think that has to do with Phil Street retiring and uh, maybe people didn't know who to call or, but they they found us again, maybe. Um, so those are picking up. And uh, a couple of communities I'll mention, uh, Constantia and Lyons Falls, both have some new people running the, their planning boards and doing planning review. So we've been doing a lot of TA and training with uh, those two communities lately. Um, so things are basically, things are getting back to normal um, in planning for the commission. It's a good thing. Thanks, Matt. I did want to mention, um, and, and Joe might want to, you might know a little bit more about this, although I think John Hell is the one that attends the AVA board meetings, but I don't know if any of you have seen the, the AVA stuff going on. There's a big potential project on the former AVA test site. It got purchased by a group out of the city, New York City area. They're talking about quite a proposal. Um, you know, there's, you can go on to town of AVA's website if you want and see some their diagrams, they have quite an information packet put together. They're actually working with Nan Stolzenberg from Community Planning Associates. If you, Nan's really a top notch planner, she's working in the area before. She just was the consultant on the Lewis County um, Ag Environmental Protection Plan. Um, she knows ag, she knows upstate, she knows this kind of area. Um, she's working with them, but there was a bit of a controversial um, planning board meeting a couple of weeks ago. Our name got thrown out there a little bit. Um, why isn't the Tugfield Commission here? Of course, you know, we don't go to planning boards unless we get asked to go to the planning boards. So um, I know there's a town board meeting tomorrow night. We've talked to John Hell about, you know, what, what we do, what we don't do, just prepare him in case he gets, you know, asked. Uh, and also both um, Matt and Jean have spoken to the supervisor and a councilman there in Ava just, just to touch base and remind them that we're here if they need us. Um, but after that controversial meeting in Ava, two of the planning board members resigned, whether it was related to that specific project or they're just... It wasn't done. the chairman. It was the chairman. <laughs> yeah, um, Justin and uh, Dan Rundle. The ones that so we'll have some new Ava planning board members. It'd be a, a great opportunity to do some training and help with that situation. So just an example of, you know, things are starting to percolate and happen a little bit more. A lot of that, the meeting got very so heated, they moved outside. Yes. You know, there was like 70 people or 90 people there. Um, there's a Facebook video if you want to watch it. It's, it's not possible. No, it's not. It's not possible. A, okay. a lot of, yes. And the chairman that resigned just in beta was a real asset. He's an engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, young man, very capable. It's unfortunate that he resigned. Yeah. But there's a lot of, there was a lot of rumors or negative comments beforehand. The crowd was already stirred up 
before the meeting and, and a lot of prejudicial views about who was going to be using this land, where they were coming from. Um, what I have heard is that some of the people involved had already bought homes in the Google area, large homes, specifically two bed and breakfasts that had been on the market for years have already been purchased by them. So it's gonna be interesting. And the Ava test site property was owned by the federal government uh, when Griffiths was open. The town has had it for like 20, 25 years. They no, logged it. Logged it twice. No road frontage. There is a building there. And I know Ava was always going to do something with it. <clears throat> but there was an unexplained liquid on the floor in several places that never dried up. <laughs> Which made it like a any kind of development or use by anybody a little scary. And yeah, that they so all they did was log it and they had it listed for sale. And then they, yeah, so it's, it's a large interesting, acreage. interesting oh, yeah. avenue to this is that the town owned it and pretty much it and sold it, you know, to this is a little another wrinkle in the. Mm -hmm. And the meeting where there was a lot of controversy, it was the first time the town had heard about the plan at all. You know? And uh, it was the introductory meeting to the planning board. You know, that they really didn't know anything about it. So, so last night, last night, the last time, the last time the set place, they took no point. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they had already done a lot of work behind the scenes. And the so they probably won't get that. <laughs> you saw the video. Are you thinking about me? It's just yeah. So, so that's all I got for you. I mean, just as a side note, I'm looking at the the lit website, and what they are is actually a school that offers mostly industrial certifications. And they have brick and mortar in seven states, and they teach anything from accounting and bookkeeping to business management to IT management. Uh, they'll teach you all of the Microsoft products. You name the product, they'll offer it from SharePoint all the way down to Microsoft Office. So that they actually have a course in tourism too. So in that it's going to be a school. It's, 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 yeah. it's interesting. It could be good. Yeah. Well, they bought it, right? Yeah. Well, I think it, I'm not sure everything's signed, but oh, they okay. approved their purchase offer at the That's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. I guess we'll go right into our uh, CTHC report, Angie. Okay. Most everybody knows we picked up the door. And months ago, that's the last of anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nowhere to go, but out. <laughs> <laughs> um, that puts us at 22. Um, so even with two associates, that, that's great. That, that's a big one of the meetings. Um, so we're trying to repeat what they are. I took uh, Carly there last month and introduced her. She'll, she and I will be swapping back and forth this year. And then I think she's going to be covering them next year because I already had two meetings that night. Um, so anyway, uh, they are, they're they going to be quite busy, I think. They've got a uh, playground committee going to do something with the playground there. They've got water and sewer. Um, so they've, they've got a lot going on. So um, we'll see what happens with those events. But they won't be official until we can have a meeting and approve them, which hopefully will be this fall. Um, County Adams has also got a, a couple water studies that they're trying to wrap up. Um, so they're, they're doing some work on that type of stuff. They have a new highway superintendent, their highway superintendent, um, who's been there for 39 years, retired last fall. So he's trying to get his feet wet. He's worked with the town for quite some time. Seaville, uh, one of our other villages in Lewis County, they have got a lot going on. They recently got found out they got awarded a DEC source of water protection grant that we helped them write like I don't know three or four years ago. We had never heard any outcome from it, but that is finally underway. Um, the hope is it'll help them write a source of water protection plan to protect our reservoir um, and our water. 
They also are doing um, an income study updates because they're working on infrastructure grants for water and also um, they've got some issues with their store plant. The uh, bank is washing away in front of it. They got various problems there. Also, the last storm knocks our trees down in the Sugar River right next to the plant. So they're working with uh, DOT, some of them right by the DOT bridge. So the DOT is hoping to take some of them out and hopefully the, the town will take the rest of them out there. So uh, town of Florence, um, as, as Matt has said, they're one of my towns that asked some questions. I think they're probably be on the list soon for solar and wind updates if there's only. Um, in Harrisburg, the, at the last meeting, they got an update on the number three wind project, so I'll give you that quick. Um, all of the land, owner land, has been cleared. Um, it needs to be cleared. The land cleared for the stuff station should start in June. They're expecting turbine site construction to start in July, and both, um, the whole those turbines will be going up this time next year. So that was the update on number three. Um, Town of Leiden, uh, I got a message from their supervisor asking about um, the village court. The, they're the only one of my villages that, except Adams that has a court. Um, about how the possibility of consolidating the courts, which you can't do, you can't consolidate town and village, but the village can abolish their court. Um, so I just got that message last week. So I've been working on the going to Leiden's meeting in June. I also got a report Leiden in June and uh, try to get a meeting set up with the mayor and supervisor. And the judge should do some talking about that before I go talk to them. Um, they are also passing a moratorium because they need to work on solar law, solar, solar, solar everywhere. Uh, Lyons Falls has a new mayor um, since last fall. He's jumped into a lot of stuff. Lyons Falls is one of our busier buildings. Uh, Matt has recently been to talk to them to help them. The, their town board, their building board, excuse me, is who does the planning stuff because they have a new board voting law. So he went last week to talk to them through a site plan zoning permit review. They are also working on getting Google for Business as a domain name platform, cloud storage to get their um, records and stuff under control and have email addresses that are not personal for their board members. Um, he's also, he's got a newsletter going, he's trying to, he's, he's on smart plug. So we're gonna catch him for whatever we can, as, as we can. Um, and Nikki and I are trying to nurse him through getting the paperwork he needs to get done for the LED project so then he don't fall behind. But he walked into a lot of paperwork and the former mayor was the one that was handling all of it, so he's trying to get up to speed. Uh, there was a recent ATV poker run unsanctioned by anyone here in mean, Lewis County. Um, it was a big problem. <laughs> the person, the, the bar owner that uh, set it up, Went and talked to the county and told me he didn't think it would be enough people to hit their event law and it was going to be county roads, so he didn't get permit under the county's new event law. And then the day before the poker run, he uh, opened it up to several other bars and county trails and blah blah blah. It ended up with about four times more people than you thought. Uh, needless to say, uh, in Martinsburg, there was people parked near one of the bars all over the roads and in somebody's hayfield and they couldn't get them moved. So Martinsburg has their own event law. They're working on possibly making it a little more stringent. And several of our other towns are, are reviewing Martinsburg's to come up with their own event law because the, the abuse to the town roads just continues every year. Um, in fact, uh, Tom Turner, in fact, had somebody at their last meeting saying if they didn't close their road, the ATVs are going to sue them. So the ATV issue here in Lewis County is really eating up, let's say. Um, and according to the county legislator that covers Martinburg and Turin, uh, the county is also here and there in that to maybe try to beef it up a little more. So we can see what will happen. Uh, Martinburg has also got some small solar projects going, so there will be public hearings on them, and they have got water and sewer uh, projects both going on. Uh, Talk Montague is another one of my towns that's talking about possibly getting some solar regulations set up, and we'll see what happens there. Their county or their town highway superintendent is talking about seeing if they get the county to take over maintenance and ownership of a couple of their bridges. That'll float or not, we'll see. Uh, Osceola has started working on minimum maintenance roads. Um, the process, I met with them a couple times the last couple of weeks to get them started. They have a public hearing for the next meeting to um, the first local law that you need to do for that. Um, 
Town of Pinckney is one of the towns we're working on with mini plan uh, adoption at the moment. Once we get them done, we'll move on with that. Bill Short Lyden here just lost a trustee and they appointed a new one at the last meeting. They're another one that's got a new domain name and stuff for their email and trying to get away from personal emails. They also lost their EBW superintendent, so they have a new person there. Uh, Tom Redfield, uh, well, we have ATV issues in Redfield as well. Uh, the county sheriff has been to talk to Redfield's board, so hopefully that'll be nipped down a little bit. They also, one of the many towns where they're displaying, uh, have to have issues with snowmobile crossings, ripping their roads up. They've got about a three tenth of a mile spot that they've got fixed to $245,000 that they just fixed a couple of years ago. Um, so that issue crops up every year with our highway superintendents. I know the counties and even the state have problems with that. So far, I have heard no solutions at this point other than fix it. Uh, uh, Tom Turin, there was a brick block building that's falling in on the corner of the main great middle of the village. Um, they've been talking about taking the village or taking the building to eminent domain so they can take it down and clean it up. And then they had at first there was a fire there not too long ago, so now they've got rubble that they've got to clean up. So the town and village there work with the county to try and um, figure out what they need to do with the county. I believe it's going to take the building by eminent domain. And working on cleanup costs um, and trying to find grant funding to help with the cost for that mess. Uh, they also had a, uh, they have a new solar project coming to new pilot projects there. Uh, Western is uh, working on their official highway map update where we are right now. We'll be going around to all our towns and making sure that our official highway maps are up to date and getting them refiled correctly. Um, so that Western's what we're working on there. Uh, Greenstown, they, um, they're quite busy. We keep hearing rumblings that they might be zoning, but we haven't heard anything lately there, but they have some issues. They keep passing rule local laws to fix this issue and then this issue and then this issue. So I keep saying we zoning. So we'll see. Um, they had a, they're kind of legislative so brought a rep from Camp Serbia to their last meeting, however, which is a county owned camp. And in Queenstown, and the county's got some plans to, to use that quite a lot more. They've done some renovations and stuff there, so that was pretty exciting to hear. Um, so that the counties can put some money in the center for the Swiggle County, so that's exciting. Um, and Tom Worth is my other one that I think is going to do minimum maintenance roads. Um, they had an issue this winter where somebody moved on to a seasonal road, and in February, wanted them to start plowing it, and then it's a snowmobile trail, and so. Uh, but they have a brand new highway superintendent, so I will be working with them. They are also updating their zoning for the first time since 1981. Um, so they've been doing some meeting in person, and now Matt is uh, Matt and Elaine are on board to meet with them in this month. So that is moving forward. Um, and I think that's all for my towns and villages. So what are you doing in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, Angie? I have a question. All right. All right. <laughs> Has there been a problem with people uh, moving what they call them sheds, but they're more like little houses? Yeah. And call, you know, want to pay the building permit fee for a shed and kind of presenting it as this isn't a house, it's just a camp where we sleep and we cook outside. Yeah, and we're seeing that. It's kind of trying, and a lot of them are pre-made by the Amish or whoever. It's, that's a problem up here. Yeah, too. we're seeing that in a few places. Um, they recommend as a shed, permit for a shed, and then all of a sudden you see stove pipe fall through and curtains and whatever, and curtains, yeah. and, and then there, then there's just a camp, and then, yeah, so we're seeing problems with that all over that, and a few places, uh, pots, Oh, yeah. instead of the sheds, and in many, many places, RV uh, issues where people pull an RV in and then people want to move them. Um, yeah. So that, we a lot of our towns have passed RV laws. I think the next thing will be trying to fight them on the issue of sheds, I'm sure. Yeah. I can tell you what the law is on that. Sure. Um, state of New York, uh, 
There's no definition in the state of New York code for um, a camp or a seasonal building. If you live in it, you sleep, you sleep in it, and you eat in it, if it's blowing in it, it has to be built, it has to be to the New York State Residential Code. So, uh, being a code officer, right there, huh? <laughs> um, this is how I handle it. Number one, the Amish do not build anything to code zero. None of their buildings are built to code. Um, they don't carry any liability insurance or workers' comp, and no religious organization in the state of New York is exempt from workers' comp. So, if I can catch them, I do not let them do any construction work in the town. That should be everywhere, but each code house sometimes has its own view. But uh, in the sheds that they build, they're not built to code either. But, uh, so anybody who in my town buys an army shed, I make them bring it up to code. And uh, because they don't use any treated, they don't use any treated wood in the undercarriage, which means it will ride out probably within two years, three at the very most. Uh, none of the windows of code, the walls on the code, not insulated. So you cannot legally use it. And most of the people I deal with, I deal with a lot of people out of state that come in here. Um, once they understand the code, I mean, I have been camped, by the way, and I, this is what I tell them. I've been to court several times, but I never watched. So here's the guy who called the state. You don't believe me. So do what you want to do, but you're not going to win. And uh, the state the rules, code is. Rules don't always. Huh? Their roofs don't it's always not, hold up. Either. Of course not, because they don't build the code. They don't put any cross bracing in. They don't do anything. They don't use screws. They use nails. They don't, they don't use hurricane clips. They use toenail. Nothing is built to code. Absolutely nothing. Well, here's the problem that comes up in a lot of our area. In Lewis County and Jefferson County, in the vast majority of the towns, the code enforcement is done by the county, yeah, no. not by an individual code officer. So, Covering so many towns, they're too busy. So unless they get a complaint usually yeah. of some sort that things go through that don't go, we can't no, I so I code up. So that that is how the issue comes up a lot of times. Well, because they right they they slide through that. the cracks, I guess you could say. But all those people who work for the county also license near state for us, so they're responsible. Some of the problem, at least in the town I live in. Is they're buying pre made buildings and they're moving them on property, some that already have a house or a camp, and they say this is it's just a shed. And maybe when we have a lot of people up for the weekend, a couple of people may sleep up there, you know, and before you know it, you know, there's a lot more donors. Of Porch and there's a stovepipe and there's yeah. You know. So you know, part of it is you can't go. Or nobody has the time to go back around and check on those things to see who's doing what, where. Try to stop them from the beginning, but it's a real concern. But I, I, I tell them this: God forbid if something happens, but if something does happen, you are totally responsible for the insurance. One thing I forgot to add, if you, if you know, when uh, Angie mentioned number three, I went on to the PSC website earlier last week to check the 94C, the who's converted from Article 10 to the 94C permitting process. And there, a lot of them are in the process, but there are three projects that have total, are totally in 94C and have draft for permits out for review. So One's a wind project, two are solar projects. None of them are in the region. I didn't read the permit entirely because entirely, they're like 100 pages long, but I did notice that the wind project, um, the developer asked for the PSC to allow them to not follow some of the elements of the town's wind law or zoning related to wind. And PSC gave, them, gave it to them, said, yeah, you don't have to do this, that, and you know, it's going to win law. But on the solar laws, 
are the solar projects on neither of the ones that are on there now, the developer didn't even ask for any, to, to, to not have to comply with anything that the town said. Now, I did not look at the town's laws to see how strict or not strict they were, but I just thought that was interesting um, and I, I wanted to make the comment because we have so many towns talking about solar laws that I really do perhaps it's not as a futile of an exercise to do the solar laws as it is the wind laws, if that's kind of the pattern that's going to follow. I mean, there's only three, but that's where you're going to learn from is how they deal with these first few that they take 94 through 94 C, because that's going to be how they plan to continue, I'm sure. It's going to be interesting in the town of Watertown with our big solar project because the town rigs are very focused on very large setbacks, density, and screening. So it's going to be an expensive proposition. So we'll see um, what happens with, with that developer. In Force Fort and Boonbo, we've been working jointly on a, on a solar law. And the Planning Board and Forest Board had sent a draft down to the town board <clears throat> the day of the meeting and the day before the meeting. We got comments from uh, one was from an engineer and one was from an attorney representing the solar company, Apex Solar. Things that they thought weren't uh, consistent or whatever. So we went back through the law, some things we did change. You know, there was a couple of places where there, you could see their point or inconsistency and some things we did not, but it's, it's difficult because there's been such a push for alternative energy. You almost think that if the company asks the state to, uh, you know, throw out your regulations and let them go forward, that's what's going to happen. But so like it's, almost, it's almost like we had to pick our battles. You know, we we did make a few changes. Some we did not. So the good thing is the smaller projects are still going to come under. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So. yeah. But I I I know that your develop the developer for Watertown Townsville was very participatory in your process. Right. <laughs> as uh, well. They were. And I think it's because the developers are trying to influence those local laws. Because I, I almost feel like it's because they think that they will be upheld by the 94 yes. process. So it's important to be paying attention now. And mm -hmm. it's hard because it's hard you were getting all these comments that are voluminous when you get them. And one of the interesting things about the project in the town of Watertown is it's not just one project, but really two towns, Watertown and Hounsfield, but it's also going to be several small projects permitted by the town. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's part of the same master scheme because the financing they're splitting them up yeah and we're, that's a that's a common thing we're seeing is developers splitting them up into smaller so they don't hit certain thresholds maybe of permitting well, this i don't know why they're doing that okay. because they still have this huge megalopolis okay solar farm yeah. between Houndfield and Watertown. it's also going to be interesting because Houndfield basically has no regulations other than you've got to pay the permit. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I know the Jefferson so, County IDA is still working on their uniform tax exempt policy and how they're going to work on these, deal with these projects. They had a meeting last week that I sat in on and they're trying to come up with some kind of percentage formula that tries to protect the prime and the prime ag soils, um, but yet not make these projects totally not happen. They're trying to find a balance. We'll see how it comes out. One other thing I need to say real quick is a thank you to Elena and Matt because in the past six weeks or so, I've probably received five or six requests for a hard copy from different you know, excuse me, municipalities I've worked with in the past uh, for our regs. So it shows what a good job you did. Thanks, guys. Our pleasure. <laughs> Any other questions, Angie? Okay. Jump on the finance report. Sure. Um, so you've got copies of both. So at this point in the year, we're still working on finishing out last year's funds and we're working with this year's funds. So the top one should be the 2020-21 uh, financial statement. 
um, you know, we, we so, and this, the salary line will be done. Like we've, we've spent all of our um, personal expenses out of last year. So we were at 92% of our um, stock and budget. That's the cash number there. So, and then you can, I'm not going to go through all the details, but you know, as you can see, we were very frugal last year. We didn't know how things were going to go. So we were very careful with money. And uh, so there's a lot of money sitting on the table, but at least we didn't have uh, any layoffs or anything like that. For 21, 22, we're just starting that year. So there's not very many expenses. Uh, we're trying to still purchase some computers. It's amazing how long it takes to get through the state contract process uh, and get some quotes. Um, so here we are still without our, our new computers. We do have the new television. I need to be able to operate it better. Apparently it worked in the office, did not work here. So I will try this again before our first court meeting so I can get that worked out. But um, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has anything. Is the state pushing us to, to get into electric vehicles or at least uh, hybrid or hydrogen? I don't know because I haven't tried to buy, to replace a vehicle after the last time and it wouldn't let us. I've just kind of given up the ghost at this point. And of course, last year we weren't driving anywhere. So we are going to come to a point where we have to replace the RAV. And I'm assuming they're going to probably be pushing us at least to hybrids. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the state contract to see the vehicles to see what they have out there. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to a hybrid, but I don't think we're in quite ready for an electric vehicle. You don't have facilities to charge They're trying to build, there's one in Lions Falls, not too far from here. Um, I haven't looked at the map recently to know where all the charging stations are, but Lee's got a fully electric vehicle. He could probably tell me. Maybe he scoped them out. There's sparse. Once you hit that, they're everywhere. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, we found one in Tupper Lake, and the Fouch Hotel is right near the right next to the brewery. Not to be uh, It's free. It's a level two. Uh, there's a few around, um, but I think range is a problem. Yeah, you gotta plan your trips. Oh, I have. Believe me, my car tells me, and I double check. Uh, it's a. It, it's a nice transition um, had going from, well, keeping the internal combustion engine for fun and driving this. It's easy, piece of cake. You know, the, the amenities that are in this car right now, the way that they move is, is awesome. But I think until you see more and multiples, because you can come to a charging station, it's fine. Right. Somebody's, Somebody's there. there. And the date is fast as filling the car with you? No, so, it's not. How long does it take to fill, fill up your truck? It really depends on what you plug into. Uh -huh. The level two, and you don't need 100%. You don't need to take it to 100%. So, mm -hmm. like when we went to Topper, it's a, it was a 200 mile day. We started out with 200 miles in the car. I just topped it off. Okay. Uh, and most of them have an algorithm so that it'll do in the first hour do more and then it steps it down. So if you're getting nervous, stop and have lunch or do something like that, you're going to know. But Ted Peel and that are not exactly are these, like, friendly. Are they like in businesses or municipalities? They can be either, either, either. I think, um, which one of our municipalities is talking about? Turin is talking about getting one, I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think um, yeah. Is well, there any incentives for a municipality? I, don't know. Know. I think yeah. there are. We, we talked with the owners on uh, Rapid River, who also own the South Motel. Yeah. They, and I don't know who initiated it first, but they wound up with two Tesla charging stations from Tesla for free, and they said that not everybody owns a Tesla. Tesla actually put in the more you know universal oh. charger right there with it, uh, and eventually they have to charge. But right now, it's it's free to anybody to plug up. So I think there's opportunities. I have no idea what they are, uh, but you know, pick up the phone and call a Tesla rep and see if you get okay. the same kind of deal. It's sort of. Crappy the Tesla did because the universe of 
EVs is moving away from our the supercharges. Uh, but now, I also have a whip I could plug into a hundred twenty volt outlet here and spend the next two days. You can sleep in my little car. Have you experienced the uh, cold weather? Put yeah, it's, well, fortunately, we keep the car. It's in a heated garage, but even uh, there, it takes it's fascinating what the sectors do. Even though it's in a heated garage, as it's charging, it knows what the outside temperatures are. So this is uh, our little drive. It's supposed to be 270 plus or minus in 70 degree weather. Um, back in that sub zero April we had, yeah. it was 100% at 240, 241. Um, huh. And then the cool thing now, and I could talk hours and I'll try not to, I won't get the weeds. <laughs> if you do this thing called one pedal drive, which is you use the gas, you just take your foot off the gas and it'll start. Does it get kind of like a golf cart type thing? Like, yeah, it's kind of like it regenerates, it'll regenerate <laughs> so we generate power to the car. If you use the brake pedal, it does it. And I ask you that. So we do that. The other thing is if if you don't drive it aggressively, you can extend the range better. And most of them have different wiring modes too. Yeah. So. Huh. But I had, but you don't lose uh, capacity in the sub-zero day. It'll go, yeah. You'll, you won't have you won't get to the, the rate of the EPA rate. So I'm saying yeah. Yeah. usually the batteries you lose the lose strength when it gets down to zero with the wall. And plus you've got the resistance heating and everything. Yeah, and if you get everything's electric, so you know. So, and there's there's a you know like if you were to to do it at the state and the state would have wide put in charging station one of the things you can do is leave it plugged in and start it remotely you will heat up the cabin on the house or the office plug um, and like this one with heated seats and heated steering wheel you don't really use the cabin. Huh. And so you're not you're really spoiled. I, <laughs> I love this car. <laughs> what model does it have? I don't think it's a it's the last thing my oh okay, yeah. Oh yeah. I like the point of this car. <laughs> you know, I, I think by uh, 2030 you're gonna see things are look a lot different than they are right now. I mean the infrastructure that's getting bought, you know, just a, a few years back. The Fed was was banking on LNG and, and CNG as a you know greenhouse gas reduction plan, and that didn't work out. <laughs> you know? So you have all these companies that invested in in these uh, fueling stations that are bankrupt or out of business now. But it looks like for at least having commercial vehicles, uh, hydrogen is going to be the wave of the future. And I'm seeing all over the country you've got hydrogen fuel stations opening up on, on interstates. So. I think you're going to see electric like you've never seen well, in the next I think eight we, years. Well, you know, with this app, in checking some of the places, we want to go with more and more hotels uh, and gas stations, like yeah. in the south. Convenience. Convenience. You go, yeah, you go in and grab a snack and play your car for a while, stay overnight in the best restaurant in Hilton. I know Hilton, um, we're members of the Hilton group. They're having a, a concentrated effort to start putting electric stations in well, their properties. If, you know, if you, that's where you're going to go. They even have to walk down at the Hilton. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. It's, well, they do. But, uh, uh, it's coming. I think. But I, what I don't see is uh, if you put all this electric, 35, you're going to increase the demand, power demand nationwide. Because uh, if you're not using gas, you're going to use electric. So I don't think right now, they're not look, they're not, I don't see anybody looking at upgrading a power grid you know, or you got to have some, you're not going to operate this whole thing on wind and solar because it's inconsistent power, but I don't see any major like new plants going in, but you really need something like that to, to control your base. Uh, that's just something I think they have not looked at. Uh, you look at nothing that $2 trillion won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> Distributed to a local area. 
So you no longer need these huge transmission lines feeding large parts of basically small business housing. Because we're right now where, where I work, we're developing light. We're going to have solar. We're going to have uh, a standby generator system, and we're going to have eventually wind power. So all that goes into one microgrid and distributed in an area around us. So eventually, people will start using microgrids instead of these large transmission lines, which just you know, they're still going to need them for a lot of things. But I think if you start reading about it, microgrids are are an up and coming thing along the electric car. The sensor is getting there. You know, the, the push for community storage and better storage technology. Uh, in Europe, there's Tesla stations with the solar panels on top, and cars underneath. It's, uh, it's interesting. You know, it's supplemental. Yeah. I, this all takes me back to when I went to North Bay, Ontario with my grandson for hockey. In the supermarkets and the hotels and everything had plugins, but they were <laughs> so if it got to be 40 below, you could, right. you could get your car started. Yeah, yeah. 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 reminds me of that. <laughs> so, the, the clean energy to answer, I think, was your question at the beginning. The Clean Energy Communities program that's going on right now, one of the actions that we just tell us to do anyway is put in charging stations. Um, and if you do a certain amount of action, you can get uh, grant funding. If you do, the, I think it's four or five, you can get a designation grant. Then the more clean energy things you do, the higher amount of grant money you can get. But that's running right now, Jared, the new style is Clean Energy Communities is called. We've got a lot of webinars that we've done on, it on the YouTube if you want to watch one. And there's a chunk of money for that in the CFA, too. Yeah. Chunk, big chunk. Anything else on the finance report? Good. We'll open it up. Not that we already have, but uh, we'll open it up for public comment. Anybody uh, virtually that wants to speak or anybody in the room? Any comments, questions, worries? No, they're, 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 they're awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they Is that why they didn't blink? That's why they didn't blink. That's why we went to the smallest, the smallest screen. <laughs> any, any questions, any comments? Katie, I, I do no, remember that you talked a little bit about moving forward up with uh, Jean's position. So you're, does that mean you're going to advertise it? It'll be, yeah, I'll advertise. It'll be, you know, open to the outside, plus any internal candidates that want to apply. Okay. Yep, which is what we did with the project director last time around. Okay. Yep. So that would be within the next month or so? As long, I want to just get a little bit of a green light from the second floor. Just, yeah. So they know I'm at least doing it, you know. Um, okay. Yeah, but soon, got to start. Yeah, it's you know. like search. I mean, yeah. It's going to take time. Exactly. Let's go take that. Anybody on staff? Any questions? No. No. Nope. 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 We're all set. Well, good. Our next uh, uh, meeting. Uh, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to see Jeannie in Forceport next month. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Looking forward to that. If there's nothing else, do I have a motion to adjourn? Um,